Hello, my name is David Thompson, and today is May the 5th of 2013, and it's around 2.48 in the afternoon. I want to share with you what is the most important thing that you need to know in your life. Not only you as an individual, but really that the whole world needs to know. I'm going to define in a very scientific way what the word truth is. And I'm also going to give some very insightful understandings about that word. And out of that definition, I will address a lot of very important issues that are particularly important at this time for your life as an individual and for this world. First, I, I want to point out that a lot of people nowadays um, do a pretty good job of classifying people or categorizing people. Sometimes the motivation is to justify their own lifestyle or to build up their own ego, whatever the motivation. So we have words like, oh, that person is religious. Well, the word religious, the way they are using it, is a sociological definition of the word. It's the way it has been defined sociologically. And it would be something like this. People that are religious are people who are out of insecurity, gullible to believe in something that is not real, so that the time and energy of their life is misplaced and also counterproductive and divisive to the world community. That would be basically what many people would define a person that they say is religious as. Of course, if we look at the actual dictionary definition of the etymological meaning of this word, it comes from the French and Latin of the 12th century the word re means back, and the word ligar means to bind. It's religar, meaning to bind back. You have the Merriam-Webster online dictionary. It defines religion as relating to or manifesting a faithful devotion to an acknowledged ultimate reality or deity. So in a sense, you know, some people say, oh, you're religious if you believe in God, but really an ultimate reality may not be even God. In fact, it is, and I don't have the references in front of me, but you will find if you do your homework that it is true that there was a court case in the United States in regards to um, the belief of humanism, which is what is so prevalent in almost all the secular schools these days around the world in modern uh, countries in Europe and, of course, North America. But in this court case, they define humanism as a religion. Well, this word, to bind back, well, really, if an atheist is not religious, I don't know, because when he chooses to believe that there isn't a God, he's making a choice to believe that he can't have purpose or meaning or that he can't have eternal life. So in a sense he's binding himself back even by what he is believing. In fact, all of us believe something. And whatever we believe, whether we believe in atheism or we don't believe in uh, having any moral values and of just living for the moment, whatever we believe, we are believing something which dictates our way of life, for it is what we believe, obviously, that dictates the way we live out our life. The question is whether what we are believing is reality or not. Because reality has a way of catching up eventually with those that want to live out their own delusion and escape from reality. Well, I have to define, of course, what the word truth is and what the word reality is yet, but what I'm just saying here is that people 
are all religious. Whether they are an atheist or whether they are of some other religion, like the Christian religion, whenever you believe something, it results in a particular way that you live your life out. It, it results in you forming, whether you acknowledge it or not, certain ways that you will live. So we can basically say that really in reality everyone is religious because everyone by whatever they believe binds themselves back from something. So when people classify one another it really doesn't mean anything as far as whether they have something that is true or real. I want to um, define what truth is, but first I want to point out some of the scientific evidences for truth. We have the well-known, well-established laws of science, which is the first and second laws of thermodynamics. The first law is basically saying that matter cannot be destroyed. It could change into energy or whatever else, but it's always there in one form or another. So this law is basically saying that because you exist, something had to exist without a beginning. And then the second law is basically saying that everything over time has a tendency to fall apart and be reduced to complete chaos. So here we have two laws which when you put together are bringing out a, an amazing contradiction. Because these two laws would indicate that we should have been reduced to complete chaos in the infinite past, but here we are in a highly complex and divine, designed universe. The brain is just oh, so imperceptible. We've just been touching the surface. And then you have the discovery through the electron microscope of all these complex uh, operations of machinery within the cell. In fact, there's a book written called In Darwin's Black Box. And in it, this gentleman points out that the complexity of what is happening in these, with these machines in the cell is so great that it would be equivalent to building a spaceship that can travel to outer space and then go to another planet and duplicate itself and then go from that planet and spread throughout the universe duplicating itself. That is how complex what is in our little cell is. And it's, been, it's become very clear that it is irreducibly complex. That, that means it cannot involve. If you take one part out, then the whole piece would never work. Some of the things that are within our cell are like an alternator. They have magnets and they spin just and are built exactly like the alternator in a car. There is a tremendous amount of evidence that points towards an ultimate life source, an ultimate source of intelligence, an ultimate source of what is reality. Yes, we have those that claim to believe that in the theory of evolution. But the evidence is great and overwhelming that exposes this as a masterful deception of lies. It is intellectually bankrupt, the theory of evolution. I can say that. There are many hundreds of highly qualified scientists around the world that once believed and were strong advocates advocates of the theory of evolution that no longer believe it because they know what the scientific evidence is. For example, let me just use this theory of evolution by using the theory itself against itself. Evolutionists believe that we are evolving and that over time we will evolve to be a godlike being with incredibly great power. 
They give themselves billions and billions of years in the past for this to happen. In fact, maybe some of them even believe that there was an infinite past. But whatever they believe, they believe that over time there is this evolution. Of course, large mainframe computer, computers have calculated out the possibilities of even the most slightly complex form of life forming, and it seems pretty well impossible that this could happen, let alone the fact that atoms could be formed and uh, with their design and all the other things. And that this could result in life that would be able to be so complex that it could reproduce itself and that there could be male and fe female counterparts in all living things. But this is what I want to say about this, this belief that we are evolving. Hitler and the Nazis also, by the way, believed in evolution and that we were evolving and they wanted to speed up this evolution by torturing people and exterminating them. That was their justification, some of them. I've read some books on that. So let's take this theory and, and ask ourselves, okay, since there's an infinite past, that means there should have involved some being that is so highly evolved and so highly intelligent that he's developed powers over matter, time, and space. An infinite past or even an extremely long past coupled with the belief in evolution should mean an ultimate being would evolve onto an ultimate intelligence and power over time, matter, and space. This would mean power to span the vast eons of time itself so as to have power to annul as a reality the beginning of his being from evolution out of chaos. In other words, the intelligence and power of this ultimate being would be at such an apex of perfection as to be able to transcend time and space to the degree of swallowing up the need for such a process of evolution to exist so that in reality no process did exist. I know that's a profound statement that I'm making there, and that originates with something that I thought of back in the 1990s and, and wrote down a few years back. I did write it down in the past earlier, but that is the summation. And so, you know, one can believe this. I believe that it's even beyond this, and that we can't comprehend it, of course, and so I'm not believing that this is what's happened. I don't believe in evolution, but this is certainly an explanation. In fact, I have on my website at ultimatemeaning.com a man that is clearly not a believer. He's a phys physicist, and he's being interviewed. You can find it under Life and Death, Life and Death, Life After Death videos. And in it, he points out the different theories on physics and how what brings them all together seems to indicate that there is something pervading all of space, whether there's something in it or not that we're aware of, scientifically. And he says that this is like the neurons in the brain. So that there's some kind of intelligence attached to everything that exists. It is interesting that the understanding of an ultimate one true God has an understanding that he is omnipresent, that his spirit is everywhere attached to every particle of existence with the ability at any moment to reverse or do anything with any particle of existence in any dimension of existence. In the early 1990s I saw a television documentary called Soul. In this documentary, there was a scientist by the name of Frank Tipler, who is a cosmologist and a mathematician that was interviewed. He views mathematical evidence from matter as pointing to life being information processing. This man, again, is Frank Tipler. Which, so he believes in this information processing, which is fed into what could would be like an all-powerful computer equivalent to God. This all-powerful superintelligence could at any moment raise all that have died back to life in body and soul, 
by simply bringing forth the absorbed information. In fact, he believes that super beings in the distant future could simulate entire universes for each human being to live in with millions of worlds. This could be easily done through their technology with little or no cost. He also mentions that the only kind of life that could counteract the direction of the universe towards eventual destruction in the future would be our constitution of life, which has such unlimited potential for governance. Now, I'm pointing this out because our being is self-originating. I am going to want to define the word truth here. But maybe before I even define the word truth, get into this, I want to give some examples because there are many people today that don't believe in truth. They don't believe there's any such a thing as truth which is one reason why I want to clearly define in a very scientific way this definition a little later on. People say you can't know truth. They're saying this because they believe you can't pr prove there's an almighty creator. Well, you know, they use this word proof. Well, you can't prove this or you can't prove that. Well, I can tell you one thing. You sure can't prove the theory of evolution. It's full of holes. Maybe I should digress here before I get into this a little more and some other things I wanted to share, share about evolution. Not only is there all that evidence I've just me mentioned that points the other way to an ultimate reality, but there is also so many contradictions within every field of science for those that are purporting this. There is um, the area of dating, for example. Many of you don't realize that they formed all of these dates before they had any things like carbon dating and rhodium, strontium, and so on. They formed all of this just upon seeing different layers in the earth and drawing their conclusions. But they totally ignore the fact that there are thousands of square miles where more complex forms of life are on the very bottom and the less complex forms are where it's totally reversed. They, they make you believe that it's always this way. The simplest is on the bottom and it's always going up this way. But there are thousands of square miles examples where it's totally flipped the other way. Did the earth just flip it all over somehow? How can you flip a thousand square miles or more? You can find more details about this information at ultimatemeaning.com. There are many, many places and examples where these layers are totally in different order contradicting their theory. And then on top of that, the, the things that they're using for dating have been demonstrated at places like Mount Helens not to work. They, they did stuff there that Mount Helens spewed out the lava and it was dating millions of years old. Well, what's going on? Oh, and one can go on and there's so many examples. One can touch every area of science and touch the cellular. There's the uh, people that will point out so-called fossils that indicate that we came from apes. What a forgery that is. It's filled with holes. In fact, there's data showing all the disputes they have as to whether it was really a, an ape, a particular kind of ape, but all oh, we better present it as a man. The first one was the one with the Scopes trial. All they had was the tooth, and they formed a whole skull out of this and said, oh, okay, there you have it, the evidence that man was, there turned out later that that tooth was the tooth of an extinct pig. Then you have the forgery of the Pelttown man, where the teeth were filed, and all kinds of other things were done, and it was put in the encyclopedias all around the world, oh, we found the link. What a forgery, what a lie. And now it's been exposed as a lie, and there are other examples like this, and these skulls, you find there's a little piece over here and a little piece way over here that could have been from someone else. They put it all together and draw all these conclusions. And then form all this stuff that isn't, you know, and claim it's some kind of missing link. The evidence is very uh, superficial and filled with contradictions in every area of science. And you can look at all the details. Do your own homework. Be a realist. Face reality. And look at it yourself. 
But let's get back to what we're talking about. So people say this, that you can't prove there's an almighty creator. Well, you sh certainly can't, I suppose, in the way they're talking about it, prove anything. Yeah, of course you could have God walk right up to you in person and say, oh, now I believe he's standing right in front of me. But then you'd probably say, oh, that's not really God. That's just this creature from outer space that evolved. <laughs> if God did come down in his glory and power and revealed himself to you, you'd be intellectually persuaded. But would he have your heart? That's the question. Intellectual persuasion is not the issue. The issue is what is in our own free will that makes us make those choices. Anyhow, getting on with what I want to say here. So, they're saying you can't have a basis for consistent moral values because you can't prove something. As if they proved something with the belief in no God. They haven't proved a thing. In fact, they're ignoring all kinds. They're willfully ignorant. What they don't understand is that true moral values are qualities that always lead unto greater fulfillment of life, and that these values are clearly absorbent. In the deepest sense, they are actually stating a contradiction. They are saying that you cannot know what qualities lead unto life from what qualities tend towards death and destruction. But really, you can. It's very self-evident. There's all kinds of statistics and studies that bear out this. Soci societies have been studied, I think 5,000, there's a book written on it. It's about 5,000, I remember when I saw this. Showing what brought those societies down. In every case, it was the lack of moral value of truth, which resulted in the disintegration of the family unit. And then that resulted in the destruction of the nation. In every case of these 5,000 societies, I believe, if I remember right from this documentary I saw, or this commentary I saw on a, on a book. So, genuine morality is always constructive on the light, but we have lots of people that are religious and want to control people with a morality that isn't constructive on the light. There's certain belief systems where people, if their pride is hurt, if their self-worshipping nature is hurt, they'll kill their own children because their pride has been hurt. Well, that's the, that's the most anti-God thing there is, is self-righteousness, it's pride. God hates self-righteousness, he hates pride. It's contrary to his very being of love. <clears throat> I haven't defined truth yet but I'm planning to soon but I want to give some examples people that say they don't believe in truth or that you can't know right or wrong are really in a way hypocritical because if you're working on a job and you have to build a plane, or you have to build a bridge, or whatever you're building, you have to make judgments as to whether something you're making is going to fit properly into that overall structure. It is either going to be true or false to the purpose for which it was created. Basically, something that is true is something that is able to either channel power or contain light. It has to be straight, it has to be round, it has to have an ability to fit. And you're making a judgment, and if you do not make the right judgment, that bridge will collapse, that plane will crash. There is consequences. We're living in a cause and effect universe. That's a basic observation of science that you cannot ignore. So in a cause and effect universe, there are consequences of good and there are consequences of bad according to what is initiated. And this also is very strongly pointing towards an 
ultimate source that is constructive on the ultimate meaning, purpose in life, an ultimate source of reality. Your conscience will always line up with that which you know innately is good. It's become, it's very self-evident what is destructive as opposed to what is constructive under ultimate meaning, purpose, fulfillment in life. And your conscience will always line up according to that which is constructive under life, that which is good. We all have a conscience and it's all related to that. We can steer our conscience, we can ignore our conscience and buy into all kinds of delusions that are not reality. It's not wrong to hate what is destructive, which such as dishonesty, theft, and uh, selfishness, and murder, and so on, and many other things that erode the wholeness of the family unit and society. To be accused of hate speech because you hate what is contrary to ultimate good for a family or a society is to be accused of hating love. Righteous love speech is not to be confused with unrighteous hate speech. It is not wrong to discriminate against what is evil, that is what is destructive, from what is good and life-giving. How is it that people can classify one another today in these days and say, oh, that person is religious? And accuse someone of something that's totally not true because they believe a certain way. The question is whether what we are believing is real, is onto life, is onto meaning, is onto purpose. Many cling to religious beliefs that are supremely motivated out of the fear of losing social re recognition and security. That's the motive. It's not true. This is because such social spin-off benefits as honor, recognition, security issue out of people rallying and assembling around what they have come to believe as a group, whether it's true or not. In turn, these benefits can then eventually evolve through corruption as the main focus in the guise of so-called truth. Thus, religion is reduced to a mere social structure that is ultimately lived onto instead of what is genuinely true. There are many examples we can see of this. You can take, for example, in the area of health breakthroughs. There are many drug companies that make billions of dollars. And right now there is a, quite a paradigm shift happening in this area where there are uh, coalitions of medical doctors and scientists such as at the Life Extension Foundation, Health Sciences Institute, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine that are working to prove that natural products and showing the testing that shows that natural products work better than drugs without side effects. Well, what does this do? It, it causes all kinds of legal battles because the drug companies are having all these billions of dollars being threatened by this. They're going to lose all this because this discovery is going to solve all these disease problems in a natural way and you can't make a lot of money out of something that's natural because you can't get a patent on it. They have, at Life Extension, I read an article that said on average it takes 15 years for breakthrough discoveries that people can use right now to eventually be known by the public. Why? Because of money and greed, because of red tape, and because of ego. People's pride is hurt. So what we have is an organization that can start out with good intentions and end up being an end unto itself instead of serving the purpose for which it was created. And this happens in every facet throughout the history of the world in various organizations and nations and churches and so on. 
I can take, for example, from a Christian viewpoint that Moses and different people were raised up supernaturally by God when they went through the wilderness of trial. Moses was 40 years being trained by the Egyptians. Another 40 years in the wilderness having his ego die, more or less, and then God calls him and uses him to raise up and lead Israel. But then as time goes on, you have these leaders that have other motives that weren't raised up supernaturally by God, that didn't live the life. And they start forming a hierarchy of control because they're only interested in their, their own life and their own security and their own ego. Those that crucified Christ were worried about their hierarchy being undone. They wanted people to look up to them. People have a revelational truth, like in the church history. And at first it's a really a genuine revelation and relationship, but that as time goes on, maybe by the third generation, they started to form a hierarchy around that truth and to enshrine that truth, and eventually it's just been intellectual. And then some other people come along, and they find something that's even a greater understanding and revelation, and they are threatened, and so they're given the cold shoulder. Oh, and there are many cases of persecution and the discovery of polio and or various vaccines. People were terribly persecuted. I think some were even martyred. The one that discovered that the um, planets revolve around the sun and others. Today we see examples. In the theory of evolution, there was a movie that came out called Expelled back in 2008, exposing the terrible uh, prejudice and actually very terrible persecution that happens in the universities in the United States and probably in other parts of the world when teachers are willing to speak up and stand for a truth that is exposing that evolution is a lie. If they have the truth, why are they so threatened so that they uh, fire these teachers? If they have the truth, they'd want to debate them. If they have the truth, but no, what's happened there? You have this theory, and then people's prestige is formed around it. Professors, people look up to them. There's money involved. All of these things are factors. But the main thing is probably the pride. People are not willing to acknowledge that they are wrong. And so, what may have started out with good intentions ends up being an ends unto itself. So I'm inventing a new word, and this word is formed from two words. The first part of the word is narc, from the word narcissism, meaning self-admiration. Excessive self-admiration and self-centeredness. The second part of the word is the word agogri from the Greek word egos, meaning leader. This creates the new word narcagogri. It would be defined like this. Leadership of individuals, organizations, or governments that have over time become an end unto themselves by deviating to seek their own interests and survival above that of whom they were meant to honestly serve or present what is true to. Thus, this organization or nation or individual has narcogog or has become a narcogogry. But I want to address what I want to do here. That is that I want to define what truth is and all of its implications. I've shown some of the things that point towards an ultimate reality, and it's only ultimately reality that can satisfy the inner depth of your being. You will never find reality in something that is temporal, and that leaves you empty after you've experienced it. It's like a sucking black hole in outer space always grasping for self, 
always grasping to to fill an emptiness that can't be filled. It's like a vessel that has cracks in it that can't hold water. There's a verse in the Bible that says you have hewn out cisterns that can hold no water. Now, truth can be illustrated this way. If you have a container that doesn't have any cracks, that's totally whole, then it's able to hold the life that you put into it, such as water. If there's a crack, it will dissipate. The way I'm going to define truth here is through the illustration of this glass that it is totally whole. And this is... So what is truth? There is everything that points towards this ultimate superintelligent source, which is a life source of the universe. When you look up the word truth in the dictionary, it's basically defined as that which is real. And if you look up the word real and reality in, in, in a different dictionaries, it, you basically get this definition, that which is everlasting, unchangeable, and immovable. So that's what reality is. Something that has no beginning, no end, never changes. And we are in a universe that's filled with creativity and life and meaning and purpose that points towards this ultimate reality. So what is the quality of government, or the quality of this ultimate reality, it has to be a quality that is able to contain unlimited life and unlimited power, and actually even be the source of it, and to contain that forever, without end, without any corruption. In other words, it's not corrupted by unlimited life and power. And limited life and power is not dissipated by this quality of being, if you can call it, which I will call it. What is this quality? It has to be a quality that is ultimately trustworthy. There's only one quality that it can be, and that is ultimate, perfect love. But what is ultimate, perfect love? Well, let me define that. Love is a quality of being that is able to always choose the highest good, that which is constructive unto life and meaning and fulfillment and purpose, that is the highest unto that. It always chooses that. And it always chooses it out of a creativity that is self-originating. Because, you see, you don't have love if you have a robot. But if you have your own free will, that means you are the source of your own action. You are self-originating. That is why you are self-responsible. And that is why we cannot blame God for creating the devil. God didn't create the devil. He created beings that have the capacity to love because they have free will because they are self-originating and the source of their own action. Which is the other reason is why he doesn't reveal himself directly. It's because he doesn't want a mere intellectual response. He wants your heart. So God will, with, will hide himself so that you will be drawn either in the direction of ultimate meaning and purpose and truth, or in choosing your own delusions. But this quality of being that is love, that is self-originating, is very creative. It's only that that can go against the tendency of the second law of thermodynamics to be destructive. It's only that that can expand and ever expand against it, is love. Love is, is a quality that is ever expanding, ever creative, ever increasing, in good and in constructiveness. But what is the essence of this quality of love? 
Well, I have made a little brief definition of it. I could say it in my own words, probably even better maybe. But it's this, it's a quality of being that makes free self-originating choices and self-denial of more immediate fulfillments in order to always choose the very highest good towards the whole of meaningful existence. This is only as these choices are in submission onto the highest good, which is ultimate perfect love, who is God. This love has to have such a purity of integrity that it will not in the slightest condone the slightest word, deed, thought, or action that is contrary to it. In other words, this love is a blazing fire of judgment against the slightest that is contrary to it. If it wasn't, it would no longer be this perfection of love that could hold the universe together, that could possibly be the originator of all life. But because it is, it is a blazing fire of judgment against all that is contrary to it. That is why God could not even look at the children of Israel in the Old Testament lest he broke out his fire because he could not violate his being in the slightest or condone the slightest that was contrary to his being of love. That is the only way there can be the containment of unlimited light and unlimited power without dissipation, without corruption, that is ever expanding. But it's more than that. Because this love would not be ultimate if that was all there was to this quality of being. What is amazing about this love is that in its integrity and purity that will not condone the slightest contrary to it. It is transcendent in being able to have the moral power to provide mercy and forgiveness. You ask yourself, how could that possibly be? God so loved you. God is love. And He loved you so much that He came and expressed himself into this time and space realm in Jesus Christ and suffered more than you, a mere creature, and humbled himself more than you, a mere creature, and took judgment upon himself. Only God could be a perfect substitutionary sacrifice to take judgment upon himself for you. No creature could possibly be perfect enough to be a sacrifice that could absorb the sins and, and the things that are contrary to his being of love that require judgment. Only God could himself be such a sacrifice. And if we were to say and believe that it was a creature that could die for us and take away our sins, we would be worshiping that creature and giving glory to that creature instead of to God. Whatever we trust in, whatever we put our worth in, is where we are putting our glory and our worship. So if a person is trying to get rid of their ego through meditation of some kind of philosophical belief or religion, through doing chanting or whatever, what are they doing? They're just refining their ego beyond the comprehension of their mind. It's like you're trying to crucify yourself. You'll always have one hand free. The only way that you can get rid of the destructive aspect of ego or pride is by seeing that it must be broken, and that the only way it can be broken is when you recognize that you are wrong apart from your life source, your creator, your God. God is ultimate reality. In fact, that is a name for God in the Bible. He is called the I am that I am. In Hebrew it is Ahiyah, Asher Ahiyah. God is the I am that I am. He is that ultimate reality. 
that loved you so much and suffered more than you, a mere creature, and all he's wanting is for people to repent and believe on him. And I want to explain also in relation to this an understanding, because there are many that believe the Christians believe in three gods. And I want to clarify that, that we do not believe in three gods. God transcends the time and space realm as the Father. He is the originator. The word Father basically means originator. He's the one that sees the end from the beginning. He is beyond the time and space realm. He also must govern in the time and space realm, so he expresses himself into the time and space realm. The word expression means son. There's only one son, and that is Jesus Christ, who is the full expression of God into the time and space realm in order to relate with his creatures. So you cannot govern beyond time and space only. You must also be able to govern within time and space to be God. So that means that you need to be a person beyond time and space to govern in that realm. And it also means that you need to be a person within time and space in order to relate to your creation within the time and space realm. And God also is attached to every particle of, his, of existence that he has created by his spirit. So you have the triunity of God in governance. And in fellowship within himself, in total unity and oneness, there's not three gods, there's one God. In three personages of government. So I wanted to clarify that. And this God loved you so much. No, he's not so small that he cannot do it. He's so great that he could do that. It, it is the greatness of God that he could condescend and love us enough to be a sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice, to live a sinless life. And through his obedience against the principle of death and destruction, took the first man, Adam, and as it were, carried him to the cross and nailed him to the cross so that you could be brought into a new nature in him as the first Adam that did not sin. So God is love. And what makes God's love ultimate perfect love is that he can be transcended in this mercy without violating the integrity of his love. This means that creation and you as an individual can have ultimate meaning and destiny. If God could not be transcended in mercy, he couldn't provide to his creation ultimate meaning and purpose. Which would mean he would be imperfect because he would be creating creatures that he couldn't give purpose and meaning to. So the evidence that God is God is that this love is transcended in the power, the moral power that has been demonstrated in his love to provide forgiveness that can be assured to those that are repentant and call unto him. So when you cry out unto Jesus Christ and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and you cry from the depths of your heart, the Spirit of God will come into your being. It's like this. You're, this is the state you're in before you know God. It is self-worshipping. It is self-grasping. It is like a black hole. It is destructive. It can never choose the highest lasting good like the being of God. But there comes a point where we may need to make a choice, and it's this. We need to make a choice as to whether we are going to fear God or not. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm talking about fear unto life. It is healthy to fear the law of gravity, for example. When we choose to fear God, we are making a choice to perceive reality for what it is. And that is the reality that I just described to you. A love that is 
so pure that it will not tolerate the slightest that is contrary to it. That is the defensive aspect of God's love, known as His holiness, that requires judgment. That love requires judgment. We must be willing to acknowledge that and that we fall short of it. But we must all the more acknowledge that God's love is so great that it is transcendent and the power to forgive because he sent his son who died on the cross. And so here you are. And you cry out and you acknowledge. You see him for who You choose to fear God, to perceive God for who he is. And you recognize your need and you, your spirit opens up. Now it's like a hand that's open, which represents selflessness. This is the only thing that breaks ego. That breaks the deception of self. Now your spirit is open, representing selflessness, and the Spirit of God comes in to dwell with your spirit. And now your hand can't close, because the Spirit of God is dwelling with your spirit in that state of trust, and it's a new nature a new divine nature, and you have eternal life. That is good news. <clears throat> now you may feel like someone that is so messed up and so broken and shattered in your life that you don't feel like you or deserve God's mercy. But I want you to know that if you are a cracked vessel that's been cracked to pieces and, and feels so empty, if you are thirsty, you can cry out unto Him. Christ said, whoever is thirsty, come and drink of the water of life. Drink freely of the water of life. And He says, whoever believes with their heart into Me, out of their innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. But you can't be thirsty if you're going to hold on to your pride or if you're going to hold on to your desire to live your own little world and ignore your ultimate meaning and purpose and destiny, which is heaven. If you ignore it, you'll lose it. You'll be in hell. Because when you're cut off from the love of God, all that's left is torment and hell for eternity. But you... God will take the cracks that are in that vessel of yours from the hurts of the past and he'll fill them with the gold of his presence and make you a vessel that can contain beautiful water that can be brought forth in beautiful creativity in your life and your destiny can be assured that it's heaven when you come to the place where you say that you want him to be the treasure of your life, you want God to be your treasure because he is love and he loves you so much that he was willing to suffer and die on the cross for you. This is good news. This is such good news. I mean, it's beyond description. Did you ever recognize that everything in the creation has male and female counterparts? That this is a reflection of this great plan God has? He has a plan for a corporate bride. Do you want to be part of that corporate bride? I'm not talking about joining some denomination. I'm talking about being part of his corporate bride. You know... People might say, well, why would God allow all this suffering and all the terrible things that are in this world to happen? But you're forgetting one thing, that when you create beings with free will, there's the potential for hell and heaven. And so there needs to be a process to bring one's free will that is so self-originating into harmony with the source of harmony, which is God, who is love. And what we're going through in this world is this process. It involves a lot of suffering and death. That's true. But there's an ultimate purpose. You see it reflected in male and female counterparts in all creation. And that purpose is that he would have a corporate bride from every background coming into genuine love with him and with one another. That's what Christ prayed in John 17.
I can't be addressing the Christians right now, but God is calling them out of denominationalism to come back and be his corporate bride. But, you know, people will say, well, God, why would he allow all this suffering? Well, this is, here's the issue here. God would not want to create robots. If he said, well, we better not create beings that have the capacity to love, because if we do, then there's the potential for hell and there'll be all this suffering, so we better just have robots. I think I'll just have robots. That would be going against the very nature of God, which is love. God is going to create what has the capacity to love, for he is love. And that is the only quality that any, anyhow, that can be a go the governing source of the universe against all the tendencies of destructiveness in the second law of thermodynamics. So if there are beings that are exposed to the truth such as us, and we choose to ignore that love of God and want to live our own life or hold on to our bitterness and rebellion against God, though it isn't God, then that means we'll be like a house when it's built. There's certain things that are lost in that house. There's sawdust and all that. But the purpose is that there is a house. The purpose is that all the stones come together to form a house that God can inhabit and dwell in. So God is not going to negate this ultimate purpose because of those that of their own free will, their own self-originating choice, make the, make the choice that they don't want to be part of this wonderful purpose and plan. If they want to make that choice, that's their choice. God is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on people. So all the suffering and hell itself is nothing compared to this ultimate purpose. In fact, the Bible says, I has not seen their ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. We are living in the last days. And his purpose is soon coming to pass. And it says in the word of God that he will shake all things that are shakable, that what's unshakable might remain. And there are people now, even where I am, that are gathering together, coming out of all the denominations, and they're not interested in any programs or structure. They're interested in getting on their faces before God and crying from the depths of their heart and breaking their heart before God in humility and reverence and meeting with him, and worshiping him, and letting his presence come down. And the more his presence comes down to the earth, and the more his corporate bride is forming in every nation around the earth, the more the things of this world and the governments of this world that are based on a principle of destructiveness will be shaken. And then there will be the return of the kingdom of God as described in the word of God. And he will judge all people. And it's described in the book of Revelation. For example, in Revelations chapter 20. You can read that. And it says, And I saw a great white throne, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So there's good news that you can be part of the everlasting kingdom of God's love, where eye has not seen or ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. And that's what I'm wanting to share with you here, is the good news of how you can have everlasting life. If you are sincerely wanting to enter into a genuine relationship where you are filled with the Spirit of God and with communion and fellowship and reconciled to God, just go to my website at ultimatemeeting.com, fill out the form there, where you can pray a prayer. 
I could lead you with a prayer right here, I guess, as well. For those of you that do not know whether you know there's a God or not, I would pray this prayer. God, if you are real, please reveal yourself to me. All I want is the truth. I'm hungry for the truth, God. I'm tired of all the emptiness in my life. Would you please reveal yourself to me? If what this person is saying is true, God, I want it. And for those of you that have already decided that you believe, I want you to pray this prayer. God, I believe in you. I believe in the full expression of you and your son, Jesus Christ, that you died for me and rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and to cleanse me of all my sins through your blood that was poured out. I ask you to come into my life and to be the treasure of my life, to be the center of my life, to be my God, my Lord, and my Savior. Fill me with your spirit and lead me to your people where I can be part of your bride. That's all I'm going to share. I pray that many of you will respond to this end time message. And you can also go to my website at love realize.com loverealize.com where I preach for about an hour and 15 minutes or more every week and have some very interesting videos as well to watch. Thank you.